friends and shalom. This is Tom with Truth Ignited Ministry, and this is part two of my message, Insulting the Spirit of Grace. To continue with this message, I'm going to start by talking about the lie that's called eternal security. See, another aspect of counterfeit grace teaching is this lie that is commonly called eternal security or once saved, always saved. This is the belief that once you've prayed the so-called sinner's prayer, an invention of the modern Christian church that's not found anywhere in the Bible, you're saved regardless of what you do after praying the prayer. To the most extreme views, it would even say that a person can go to church one time in their entire life, make an emotionally driven response to an altar call, pray this sinner's prayer at the direction of the preacher, and then live the rest of their life no different than they did before this event, but they're still saved because they got saved, you know, that day, and now they're eternally secure, or they're once saved, always saved. Well, while even many eternal security teachers wouldn't go so far as to say such a one actually got saved, the point is that the beliefs of counterfeit grace and eternal security create the counterfeit Christians that Stephen Hill spoke of, as noted in part one of this teaching. Author and teacher John Bevere addresses this in his book, The Devil's Door, How Obedience to God Can Protect You from the Bondage of Sin, where the following discourse is written, Once saved, always saved? A very deceptive doctrine has been propagated throughout the church. It claims that once an individual is saved, there's no way they can ever lose their salvation. It's a controversial subject, yet it need not be. The only reason it is controversial is because some teachings have twisted the scriptures until they say what we want to hear as opposed to God's truth. If a person's heart is set on an issue, they will funnel all scripture through what they believe rather than believe what they read. I challenge you to examine what the Bible has to say about it. Don't filter these scriptures through the teachings of Dr. So-and-so, but compare verse to verse and hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Listen with your heart. It will not lie to you. There is no no reason to fear truth if you love God, for if you truly love him, you will never want to leave him. Now, now in his book, Bevere has certain scriptures that he looks at, but I want to look at a specific series of scriptures that are plainly in contrast to the views of eternal security. My brothers and sisters, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that the one who turns a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sin. And that's from James 5, verses 19 to 20. Notice that this is someone among the body of believers, someone who was saved and strayed from the truth. For if, after escaping the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah, they again become entangled in these things and are overcome, the end for them has become worse than the beginning. For it would have been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than after learning about it to turn back from the holy commandment passed on to them. And that's Second Peter 2, verses 20 through 21. It, and if you have, you know... If you've escaped from the pollutions of the world, wouldn't that by definition mean that you are or were saved? Next, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, having tasted of the heavenly gift and become partakers of the spirit of Yah, and having tasted the good word of God and the powers of the Olam Haba, and then having fallen away to renew them again to repentance, since they are again crucifying Ben Elohim for themselves and publicly disgracing him. And that's Hebrews 6 verses 4 through 6. Now, this one, for if we keep Keep on sinning willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but only a terrifying expectation of judgment and a fury of fire about to devour the enemies of God. And that's Hebrews 10 verses 26 to 27. And then this one. He who wins the victory will, like them, be dressed in white clothing, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. In fact, I will acknowledge him individually before my Father and before his angels. Revelation 3, 5. You know, if your name is blotted out, then it was there to begin with. Only saved people have their name written in the book. So, to have it blotted out means that somehow you lost your salvation. And then this one. 
Whoever strays from the path of wisdom ends up in the congregation of the dead. Proverbs 21, 16. So, you know, this is a person who was on the path of wisdom, but strayed from it. And then, and then I want to read that from another, that was from the Tree of Life version. And I want to read this verse again from the Complete Jewish Bible. It says, the person who strays from the way of common sense will come to the rest of, will come to rest in the company of the dead. You know, while there are certainly many other passages I could list, I, I think you get the point here. Most of the views of eternal security teaching ride on passages from Scripture that say such a, things as, no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand, John 10, 28-29. You were sealed in Him, Ephesians 1, 13-14, and I'll never leave you nor forsake you, Hebrews 13, 5. The use of such passages to endorse the views of eternal security ignores one very important fact. In every single case, you are still permitted through free will to walk away from God or reject Him by rejecting His Word, whether in total or in part. Once you consider that you, the professing believer in Yah, the Father and Creator of life, and the King of the universe, a proclaimed follower of Yeshua, the Master and Messiah, and a presumed recipient of the Holy Spirit, you are still capable of walking away from God and rejecting His Word through deciding not to obey it. Eternal security no longer has much of a foundation, you know? Then, then when you bring in the scriptures listed above that plainly endorse the view that salvation can be lost or discarded, there's no actual argument left in favor of eternal security. It becomes just another lie of the hyper-grace movement, both of which have their roots in the Protestant Reformation and the teachings of men like Martin Luther and John Calvin. But then we'll have but but that will have to be for another time when we can dig into the origins of modern Christianity. Now let me also tell you that I don't believe in the yo-yo effect created by many who oppose eternal security to the opposite extreme. Many in seeking to teach against the lies of eternal security create a doctrine that says every time you slip up, you're no longer saved and have to get saved again. You know, whether it's the confessional booths of Roman Catholicism or the misconception that every time you sin, you should respond again to the preacher's so-called altar call, you know, this too is misleading. Look, the only sins you can even repent of after committing to live for Messiah are unintentional sins. The Bible is clear in both Old and New Testaments that sins committed with intent, those where you know what the Bible says and you do it anyway, are sins that there is no longer a sacrifice for. Read Numbers 15 verses 22 through 31 and Hebrews 10 verse 26 and 27 again. Though while still in error, this save law, save loss teaching does not threaten to mislead anyone to hell the way eternal security teaching may. By misleading people to constantly live in repentance through worry and fear, at least people are constantly repenting and striving to live for God. This may give people a greater chance of eventually getting it and selling out to loving God through living by His Torah. Eternal security deceives people into thinking that they can just live in sin and still be safe and saved. This is a very dangerous lie that sadly too many people have bought into. You know, check this out. Counterfeit grace is actually legalism. You know, legalism is a very misunderstood word in Christianity, especially among the hyper-grace crowds. It seems that any time a person promotes obeying something in the Bible that those on the receiving end don't want to receive, the standard response is, that's legalism. I'm saved by grace, you know. It amazes me that people would rather hold to a lie that deceives them than to receive a truth that will set them free. The late Chuck Colson was one of the most regarded evangelical Christian ministers of his day up until his death in 2012. Prior to his conversion to Christian faith, he held a position as the director of the Office of Public Liaison under United States President Richard Nixon. Colson was among the Watergate Seven convicted during the famous scandal that ended the presidency of Nixon. As a result of his actions, Colson served seven months in jail. It appears that it was through this experience that he was able to establish the ministry he felt God called him to. It does often seem that the most sincere of ministers are those who rise out of darkness the way Moses and the Apostle Paul did. Now, it's not my place to say whether or not this man was the real thing. To my knowledge, he did not live by the Torah, and I've got certain beliefs about that, but I want to consider something that this man said. 
In his book, The Faith, Colson presents the following statements pertaining to holiness and legalism that I believe are worthy of consideration. He, he asks, what is holiness then? Most believers and many Christians confuse holiness with following a legalistic list of do's and don'ts, or reduce it to piety and attentiveness to religious duties. In reality, holiness embraces piety, but it is much more. It is the heart of the Christian life and every Christian's destiny. As one devotional writer put it, God has one eternal purpose for us, that we should be conformed to the likeness of his Son, Romans 8.29. We are to become holy as Christ is holy. We are to become true Christians, the root meaning of which is little Christ. Indeed, through holy living, Christians are called to share in God's work of redeeming creation. This holy life is the natural outgrowth of the exchange of the cross of our lives for Christ's life. Once reconciled to God, we enjoy, as Peter said, a share in the divine nature. See 2 Peter 1 verses 3 through 4. Jesus' relationship to the Father is one of perfect obedience in love. As we obey, God's grace enables us to live like Jesus. Notice several points in these two paragraphs from Colson's book. Number one, holiness is not a legal list of do's and don'ts. Number two, holiness embraces piety, the quality of being religious or reverent. And number three, as we obey, grace enables us to live like Yeshua. You know, regardless of what Colson believed or how he lived his faith, if we follow these points to their most logical conclusion, they lead us to a Torah positive faith practice. Legalism, as it pertains to the life of the believer, is always one of two things. Number one, legalism is any time a man-made rule or tradition is instituted within religion and placed either equal to or above the commandments given in the Torah. And number two, legalism is the attempt to obey the Torah for the purpose of earning earning, or maintaining salvation. Now, for the purposes of this message, I'm going to focus on that first type of legalism. Earlier, I mentioned that counterfeit grace is a form of legalism. This might seem confusing because, by definition, legalism requires man-made rules and traditions that are placed equal to or higher than the Torah of God. Those who endorse the, and teach the counterfeit grace message are, called, are often called antinomians, which is a fancy word that refers to people who teach that under grace we were not bound to follow the Old Testament laws, the laws of Moses, you know. So how can the teachings of a counterfeit grace, which removes the need to follow God's law, be a form of legalism when legalism requires God's law to be in place so that new rules and traditions can be placed equal to or higher than God's law? You know, legalism is any man-made rules or traditions that add to or take away from what the Bible says. Most people only associate legalism with rules that add to the word, but rules that take away from the word are just as damaging. The doctrines, theological views, and teachings of hyper-grace take away from the word by teaching that the rules in the Torah, at least in part, have been done away with. This is legalism. Counterfeit grace and the antinomianism that accompanies it still require God's law in order to work. The teachings of the hypergrace movement are themselves man-made rules and regulations, false doctrines that unbiblically void God's law. This makes it a form of legalism. So anytime you teach something that demands a return to holiness through obeying what the Bible says and someone says to you, that's legalism, I'm saved by grace, they are in reality the legalists that they're trying to accuse you of being. This means that it's legalism to say that we do not have to keep the Sabbath day. It's legalism to say that we're permitted to eat unclean things like pork and shellfish today. It's legalism to shun the holy feasts of Yah. It's legalism. Anytime someone takes a commandment from the Bible and says that under grace, we no longer have to follow that commandment or that the commandment is made void. In other words, while many present them as opposing beliefs, counterfeit grace and legalism are in in reality, the same thing. They go hand in hand. It's never legalistic to obey something that the Bible says to do. That's what we're supposed to do. So now let's talk about true biblical grace. 
See, now that we've established what the counterfeit grace of modern Christianity is that insults the true spirit of grace, let's take a moment and look at true grace. After all, a grace that does not produce a life of obedience to God's Torah is a false grace. So true grace, in turn, is a grace that results in obedience. Titus 2 verses 11 through 12 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, training us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live in a manner that is self-controlled and righteous and godly in the present age. Ungodliness and worldly desires are alternate words for sin, and 1 John 3 4 defines sin as the breaking, transgressing, violating of the Torah. Deuteronomy 6 25 defines righteousness as following or living by the Torah. So if we apply all of this to what is stated here in Titus, which is the closest thing I have found to a definition of grace within the text of Scripture itself, as in not defining grace based on a Hebrew or a Greek word used for grace, but more on what a passage of Scripture itself says in a defining manner, then grace that saves is that which leads us to stop breaking the Torah and then empowers us to live by the Torah. If we want to hold to a true biblical concept of grace, this would be it. Grace is not something that frees us from the law as Christians believe and teach. Quite the contrary, grace leads us to live by the Torah of God. Let me add something as a side note here. Our responsibility to God is simply to teach the truth and obey the Bible for ourselves. We are never ever to judge or accuse someone regarding what they do. We don't know what they do or don't do. You could be wrong about the way you interpret the Bible, especially if you don't dig into cultural context and the original languages used when it was written. So never make assumptions, accusations, judgments, and above all, do not guide gossip with your church pals about what you think someone is doing or not doing right. The Bible says that we must warn the wicked of their wicked ways, and if we don't, then God will require their blood at our hands. Ezekiel 3, 18 through 19 and 33, 7 through 9. But if that warning is not heeded, we're to leave that house or that town and shake the dust off our feet. Matthew 10, 14. I can assure you that anyone who has read my written works or heard me teach has been warned of their wicked ways. What they choose to do with it is on their hands now. Can you say the same? Earlier when looking at scriptures that counterfeit the views of eternal security, one of the passages I listed was Proverbs 21.16 from the Complete Jewish Bible Translation, which states, The person who strays from the way of common sense will come to rest in the con company of the dead. The common sense approach to scripture is to simply do what the Bible says always erring on the side of caution. For example, the Bible says don't eat pork. Common sense says that if the Bible says not to eat pork, then you don't eat pork. I mean, literally, the first act of sin that caused this whole problem in the first place was eating something God said not to eat. You know, read Genesis chapter 3. And I've got a whole study just on Genesis chapter 3. You would think that this point alone would be enough to convince Christians to keep the food laws, and I've found that in most cases, once you get someone to see that the food laws are still mandated, everything else begins to fall into place. Could this be the reason Satan chose the breaking of a food commandment to initiate sin? You know, that's some, something to think about there. I know this is so simple, but I, I bring this up using pork as the example because that seems to be the number one thing that will get almost any Christian arguing with you. I could tell Christians that they're not supposed to work on the Sabbath day, and many will ag actually agree with that. Who doesn't want a legitimate excuse not to work, right? You can convince Christians to celebrate the feast days listed in Scripture, you know, especially when you point out that their Messiah celebrated them. It's often perceived as a fun and trendy way to embrace embrace the Jewish or Hebraic roots of Christian faith by many believers, but it's accepted and it's a start. You can even convince Christians that some of the most celebrated holidays of modern Christian faith are based in pagan religions and through common sense are best avoided. But if you mess with their bacon or their shrimp or whatever other unclean abominations, you know, that's what the Bible calls it, that they want to eat, you've just invited yourself to a fight. Why is it that people would literally gamble with eternity in hell over a pork chop because that's exactly what they're doing there is no such thing as going to hell for being a little too obedient 
As I've already stated, it's not legalistic to obey the Bible. That's what we're supposed to do. And if you're really saved, that's what you will be doing. Saved people obey the Bible. Unsaved people do not. Which one are you? People ask me all the time if I think people will go to hell for eating pork or any other unclean thing. Well, Isaiah 66 is commonly understood as a speaking of the second coming of Messiah. And verse 17 indicates that he's going to annihilate those who eat swine's flesh and other unclean things listed as the abomination. Revelation 21.8 says that the abominable or detestable will have a place in the lake of fire. And those terms are applied to eating what is unclean more than anything else in scripture. Common sense, a logical response to the commandments of the Bible, always erring on the side of caution by simply obeying the Bible, is the only way to live with full assurance that you will call heaven your home for all eternity. This can only be found through Yeshua as your Messiah. But if you claim Yeshua as your Messiah and continue to reject the laws of God from his Torah, then you have a false Messiah. Galatians 1.8 says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should announce any good news to you other than what we have proclaimed to you, let that person be cursed. 2 Corinthians 11.4 says, for if someone comes and proclaims another Yeshua whom we did not proclaim, or if you receive a different spirit that you did not receive or a different good news that you did not accept, you put up with that well enough. One translation indicates that such people are gullible and fall for anything. And there's a lot of those people in churches, fallen for anything, gullible, just believe in what their preacher says. They don't, they don't have a clue what the Bible says. Today we've got people teaching a false gospel, teaching a different Yeshua from the Hebrew Messiah of Scripture through such lies as eternal security and counterfeit hyper grace. This insults the spirit of grace and provokes the wrath of God's anger. Whenever a person makes a decision regarding obedience to or rejection of a biblical commandment, that person does so with the risk of an eternal consequence. Complete and total obedience to the Torah after acceptance of Yeshua as Messiah can only ever result in a person going to heaven. One thing Yeshua taught is that those who obey the Torah and teach others to do the same will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So the decision to obey the Torah and teach others to do the same is a gamble. Either you just get to go to heaven, or you get to be greatest in heaven. That's what you're rolling the dice on when you obey and teach a Torah positive faith. Disobedience to the Torah, however, also comes with a risk. In the same passage, Yeshua says that those who disobey the Torah and teach others to do the same will be least in the kingdom. However, there are passages that clearly mark certain sins as resulting in one being cast into the lake of fire. Again, according to Revelation 21.8, this list includes, but may not be limited to, murderers, the sexually immoral, liars, adulterers, and those who are detestable, abominable. Eating unclean things, as already noted, is called detestable or an abomination, depending on you know which English translations you're using. When you choose to disobey the commandments of Scripture, even those the majority think are done away with today, you're also rolling the dice. Either you get to barely make it to heaven where you'll be labeled among the least, or you'll be sent to a place called the Lake of Fire. Now, I think I would much rather roll the dice on the option that assures me a place in heaven. Think about it from a perspective of common sense and simple logic. You know, again, don't stray from the path of common sense. If you obey what the Bible says because you love God and his son, Yeshua, and you're yielded to the leading of the Holy Spirit, then there are two possible outcomes. In both of these possible outcomes, you go to heaven. One says you just get to go to heaven, and the other says that you are great in heaven. Either way, you're in heaven for all of eternity. On the other hand, if you choose to live with disregard for the Torah of God, then of the two possible outcomes, only one results in going to heaven. And at that, you're going to be least in the kingdom. Now, I'm not going to say that I know what it means to be least in the kingdom. The Bible is not clear on that, but I certainly don't want to find out. It doesn't seem to be presented as a positive thing. Yes, I would much rather you get to heaven by the skin of your teeth than to miss heaven by the hair of 
than, than to miss heaven by a hair and spend eternity separated from God. But your odds are not favorable if you're walking the line. I've heard it argued that the outer darkness Yeshua spoke of is not actually a portion of hell, but a part of heaven outside the actual kingdom of heaven. This begins to make more sense when you consider that some prominent Bible teachers have concluded that heaven is another planet. For example, Perry Stone, a popular evangelist with a television program, says in his book Chronicles of the Sacred Mountain, it appears from scriptural evidence that heaven is a planet similar to earth. The size compared to the earth is uncertain as the earth is 25,000 miles in circumference at the equator and the planet heaven could be much larger. Others suggest since the earth has so many patterns of heaven concealed in the tabernacle, the temple in Jerusalem, and the creation narrative, that the planet heaven could be the same size as the earth. So, if heaven is thought of as another planet that we will be taken to, assuming you are accepted in, then it's not unreasonable to conclude that there is an outer darkness, a place on such a planet where people who didn't fully obey the Torah are sent to live. This is a hard concept to accept for those who have grown up with the modern Christian theologies, and it should not be received as anything less than a theory, albeit a theory that illustrates this point rather well. However, think about it. If you're already gambling between hell and being least in the kingdom, whatever that may actually mean, if you're not living according to the Torah, if you're gambling between hell and some obscure place of outer darkness on a planet similar to Earth, just to eat a pork chop, carve a scary face into a pumpkin, get some overtime pay on the Sabbath, or any other thing that you know good and well is against what the Torah instructs, then chances are that you won't even make it to some outer darkness part of an alleged planet heaven anyway. Remember, intentional sin is listed among things that are not forgiven according to the Bible. Look, let me wrap this up with this. Don't take any chances. Don't gamble with eternity. Don't live a life that insults the spirit of grace. Make the commitment today to live absolutely committed to doing what God commanded in his Torah through following the example of your Messiah Yeshua and yielding to the Holy Spirit of God that he sent to guide you in obedience. Don't just get saved according to what some church or some pastor tells you salvation is, get radically and genuinely saved to where the fire of God's presence truly comes alive in your heart, and you can't help but to search out the scriptures and do what they say. Hey friends, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen. If this message has impacted you, please feel free to share it with others. If you're enjoying these teachings, be sure to subscribe and consider becoming a $5 or $10 monthly partner. If you want to make a larger donation, please contact ministry at truthignited.com. If you're interested in more teachings like this from Truth Ignited Ministry, be sure to check out the website at www.truthignited.com and follow Truth Ignited on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. I'll see you next time. Blessings and Shalom.